Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our panel, First Nations First, From Ideas to Income. Uh, so my name is Trish Ajay. I come, also come from the Torres Strait Islands in Australia, so Wathathi country in East Cape York and Mabiok Island in the Torres Strait. Uh, but I'm now based on Gadigal country in Sydney, Australia. And I'm the head of First Nations Arts and Culture at the Australia Council. And we're very happy to be supporting uh, this deadly panel this afternoon. Uh, so I'd like to also start off by firstly acknowledging uh, the country, the land that we're on this afternoon. Uh, so I found, I did a bit of research and found the local peoples here are the Tonkaya, Koahal, Takens and Wichita tribes. Uh, so we'd like to pay our respects and acknowledge their presence, their continued practice and custodianship of this land. We also like to acknowledge their elders past and present. It's really important as Indigenous peoples to acknowledge the Indigenous lands and peoples that we're visiting as part of protocol. So thank you for being part of this panel this afternoon. We have a very deadly panel, amazing panel here. Uh, this panel will be looking at the practices of uh, Indigenous business owners and practitioners working in the creative industry space and really sort of looking at how uh, the way of being and thinking uh, in terms of bringing in Indigenous culture and values uh, into the creative industry space. So looking at you know, issues around protocols, proper consultation with elders uh, and communities, fair and equitable returns to Indigenous artists and communities. But also, as well as, I know, you know we live in a very fast-paced uh, society, so really sort of slowing down that practice and making sure that we build strong um, relationships, solid relationships with our Indigenous communities when we're working with Indigenous cultural heritage, arts and culture. So I'll now introduce our amazing panel. Uh, so I'll start with Amanda Healy, who's a Wanneroo uh, lady from New South Wales originally, but now based in Western Australia and is the CEO of uh, Kirikan, an Indigenous social enterprise working in the fashion uh, and textile and arts industry. So Amanda, can you give a brief uh, sort of biography? Thanks. Yeah, Kaya, Kaya Wanju, and in my own language, Anaganya. So I'm a woman from the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, but um, grew up in Western Australia due to, I guess my dad was Aboriginal, my mum was non-Indigenous, and we, were, we came under, I came from a time when uh, there was a lot of controls placed on our people and particularly on families and how they behaved and interacted. So, um, so I guess to me I had take a deep pride in culture and I really love the idea of um, giving back to culture. So in 2014 I started Kirikin as a social enter enterprise and uh, by that I mean that my purpose is getting sustainable incomes back to the artists that participate in, uh, that I work with in Kirikin. Um, and Kirikin itself, we digitally print gorgeous, authentic Aboriginal art that sort of looks like this <laughs> onto uh, luxury fabrics and turn them into clothing and uh, accessories. So, um, yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'll now turn to Brett Levy, uh, Kuma man uh, uh, from Queensland, based in uh, Brisbane. Um, and you're a uh, VR, AR practitioner with your own business, Virtual Songlines. And you also work with Indigenous youth and communities to empower them and bring about social change. So can you give a bit of a, a, a short bio of uh, your work as well? Yeah, yeah, well, um, I'm Kuma Fala from um, Western Queensland. and. Uh, I, um, I call myself a digital Aboriginal. So I like um, doing special things and blowing people's minds and taking them to places they've never been before. Um, I've got a good team. I, I train as many Murrays, Noongar, Kappa, whatever, that I can into my group. And, um, and generally they don't leave, they don't, they don't leave my, my team. And I love that, I love that. Um, we work all over the place and I just want to, I've got two stories. I just did a big stint in Western Queensland um, 
I did a big stint in Western Victoria, and then I went up and did some time up at NT and uh, Catherine. And uh, I don't know why or how it all came about, but it seemed like we were dealing with um, disgruntled youth. But when I met m my mob, they weren't. We were engaging them, and, and, and you know, if you take a bit of time with them, they, they connect with you. So when you, when you want to know me, I'm alive when I'm doing that. And that's so special. So I'll tell you more about that as we go. Thanks, Brett. And last but not least, uh, Lacey Trajalo, who is a Navajo woman working as a colour designer for Nike and is also the American Australian Association Fellow. So, Lacey, can you give a bit of a background on your work as well, please? Uh, yes. So, Yat E, She E, Lacey Trujillo, Yenishia. She here initially since a Kani, but she's Chin Kia Ani Dasha Chedo, but Ani Dasha Nale. Um, so, my name is Lacey Trujillo. Um, I introduced myself in my language. I am Navajo, and I also grew up on the Navajo Reservation, which is located in, there's 20, 270,000 acres spread across Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, and that's what the Navajo Reservation is. So I grew up in two small towns, Winter Rock, Arizona, and uh, Fruitland, New Mexico. Um, so currently, I am a footwear color designer at Nike, uh, specializing in women's running footwear. And I am also the design lead for the Native American Network at Nike. Um, so we are, I'm a part of the leadership team there. And just as Trish said, I'm also um, a newly scholar for the American Australian Association, as I do plan to go back to school um, this fall in, at the University of Adelaide pursuing um, my MBA. So I'm really excited to, to be here. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Lacey. Uh, so now let's get into the discussion. So the first question I have for each of the, all of the panel members uh, is how do Indigenous protocols and ethical practice play in your businesses and your non-commercial and commercial operations? <laughs> That's a really big question. So, I mean, I, I guess um, culture be comes and is a part of our lives every day. So I guess every time I work with an artist, that's a primary consideration is how do I do, how do I take their artwork respectfully and translate it onto fabric, which can be an issue. And there's a very, you know, like all of my artists tell stories about their, it might be in stories that are important to their families, it might be traditional stories that belong to them and their families, and it might just be telling stories about things like, you know, the, 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 the natural environment, like the trees or the, you know, plants that are around or the bush tucker that's important to their families. So I always consult with them when we start about what it is that, you know, that they will and won't do, and we agree that all of my artwork that I put onto, or not my artwork, I shouldn't say that, the artist work, I put it onto um, fabric. We always understand there is an agreement that I can use that artwork on all sorts of fabrics. When I very, uh, and, and in all sorts of environments, when I very first started, it became an issue with uh, a particular artist who didn't like his prints being on female bodies, um, which was, like a really interesting negotiation and discussion around that. Um, so we worked through all that and, and ultimately decided to part ways because it was just not going to work for me because even scarves, even if I printed on scarves, it's always being put, put on female and male bodies. But scarves in particular is probably more a female thing in Australia. I know that people are way more open-minded here in uh, North America. So that's always been an interesting. So we, there's a big negotiation before we discuss, uh, before we, before I start um, actually printing. But the other thing is, um, really now these days, I used to used to chase around and find artists that would be interested in putting their artwork. But these days, I find artists come to me because they understand that they understand what I'm trying to do. They understand that the the importance of social enterprise and actually doing things that are 
um, important in the community and raising awareness not just of our community but our broad culture and making an impact in, in just in the way we present our work. Um, so for me, it's, it's all about negotiation and discussion and understanding and reaching. You know, it's about sitting down, like in our, in our parlance, we would say it's about sitting down and yarning about something and, and getting, getting coming to a point where you can agree to work together. And that takes some time, sometimes. Um, and the second, from the second part of the question about commercialisation, um, to me, it's important for people that had been denied access for so many years to, um, to the economic environment in Australia, uh, it became really important for me to try and help artists who particularly, um, you know, might want, sell off a one, one piece of artwork and it's a, a very inconsistent thing. So for me, it was more about trying to find ways of getting regular incomes to artists. And, you know, I, I, I still, you know, we're, we're not making sheep stations, you know, like we're not making millions of dollars, but we're starting to improve that and starting to push into the environment a bit. Um, and, you know, particularly into the market, um, there's a lot more work to be done, of course, but. Um, the whole commercialisation process has been challenging and interesting, but nonetheless rewarding because of the because of the impact it's having on how people view our culture. Thank you. Uh, so, Brett, how do uh, Indigenous protocols play a role in your projects and business? Um, protocols are essential to what we do. Um, our work is building a Indigiverse. It's a subset of the Metaverse. And in that work, it's a decentralised system. So it's got to be um, culturally um, overviewed by First Nations people. And then in the construction of it, it's got to be involving those. It's a co-creation arrangement. So I'm spending much more time getting First Nations people on, on board. We effectively are going to deliver 80 projects. And each one of our tiles, our landscape tiles, is about I think it's about 64 kilometres by 64 kilometres in size, centred on capital cities and regional towns. So we're building a time machine. And in that time machine, we're trying to map heritage and culture. Now, I can't do that without First Nations people telling me where to go. They sometimes tell me where to go quite a lot. But, but in that whole work, it's, it's working with people who know this stuff, can see this stuff, and then maybe in the work we do, taking artefacts from museums, reconstructing them in 3D and putting them back in the context of where they're from. Another subset of our work is to map a bit like the work of archaeologists, that which might relate to the Truth Commission or the, 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 the sort of frontier wars. And in that way, we're talking about, before that even happened, where were the campsites? Where did they... Where did they gather food? Where did they gather medicine? Where did they hunt? And that sort of stuff. So mapping that knowledge is going back to spaces where that might have been taken away, where bricks and mortar now exists. So that's the work we do. And in that regard, I try to talk with land councils, people who aren't in land councils. That's important too, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and, then, and anybody who's been told a story by their, their old people. Because I think... You know, there's such a lot of knowledge there that you can tell in this way. So, and then we use the digital medium to see, to bring it to life, to transport people in a digital walkabout. And uh, that requires First Nations people to come along for the ride. We've got 77 years of work to do. That's our estimation. About seven business plans. So I, I need other people because I won't be here then. Thanks, Brett. That's a, that's a huge task. Uh, and so, Lacey, in terms of your work with Nike, do, do Indigenous protocols and sort of ethical guidelines come into the work that you do at Nike? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, at Nike, we do have collections that... Collections and also products that are inspired by our Indigenous communities and cultures. So, I'll talk a little bit more about the brand that we do have, but... We do always have um, indigenous people input in at all times. And also to 
So we do work, you know, as a designer, there's maybe about six of us indigenous designers at Nike. So we still collaborate with um, the communities to be able to bring this product out to life. And we still work with our, you know, the community members within the tribes and also the elders um, to make sure that we are telling these stories correctly and appropriately because, you know, the symbolism, the colors, um, you know, the fabrics that are used, certain things are very sacred to these tribes and we need to be like very careful um, of what are we are putting out, what do we want to share. So we are always controlling that narrative at all times. And even before this work even goes to market, we do have to consult with the community and the elders again to make sure we're doing this correctly. And you know, to give an example, this for this NBA season, I collaborated with um, the the Phoenix Suns. So currently, they're wearing the jerseys, their city edition jerseys. So if you've noticed, there's a, all turquoise jerseys that they do wear currently for the season. And I collaborated th with them to be able to culturally culturally get this right because. For me, it at least seemed to be very near dear to my heart because I am from Arizona and I also lived in Phoenix, Arizona, going to Arizona State University. And so for me, it represented a lot of um, my identity, I feel. And so this jersey is celebrating the 22 tribes in Arizona. So I feel like what was really challenging working on this project was being able to represent 22 tribes in one by the symbolisms we were using, the colors, the um, also the languages is something that we added into this collection. And so, you know, finding something that really brought all cultures together more so than using, you know, patterns from a certain tribe, we tried to incorporate all of them in one. And I feel like what makes this even too, like, well put together is we, we were able to collaborate with two, 22 tribes, which we brought in all 22 chairmen, and we took the, the word sun from all of those tribes and represented this on, on the jersey. So I feel like it was a beautiful thing for us to really you know, bring this together, even more so there have been some languages that aren't written as well, so this is something we had to collect together, and it was um, a collaboration with the community, the, especially the indigenous community of Phoenix, um, Nike N7, which is what I'll talk about later, which is our Native American brand at Nike, the Phoenix Suns, and also the 22 chairmen um, of Arizona. So I feel like it was a beautiful project and a lot of collaboration, and it took probably about you know, we started this project back in 2020. So, I mean, for a good year or so, we were, you know, going back and forth with the, the communities. And, I mean, I would encourage you all to look it up because there is so much brand um, that was put into this project. I mean, there's like videos, there's promo videos um, that will tell you exactly what the symbolism means. And, and of course, you see it on court. So, you know, they bring it out for special occasions, which is actually um, the 16th. So 316 is uh, the game that I'll actually be at to see it in person. Um, so I feel like it was just a, an amazing project. Great, thank you. That's really interesting to hear and really great to, to, to sort of see the work that Nike's doing in that space. Um, I think in terms of protocols, it's really, you know, as all the panelists have said, it's really important to ground uh, our work in, you know, what customary practices Indigenous peoples in Australia and also here in the United States do in terms of that respectful engagement, that proper consultation, um, working together to really sort of bring out the authentic voice and illustration of our cultural heritage, our stories, our images. Um, so at the government agency that I work at, the Australia Council for the Arts in Australia, uh, we're the national arts funding body, but we've developed these protocols that are really sort of best practice guidelines uh, for artists and organisations who are wanting to work and collaborate with Indigenous artists and communities across Australia. 
And so in those protocols, they talk to a lot of the points that our panelists spoke to uh, around that respectful engagement with Indigenous communities, um, that, you know, it does take more time to build up relationships, have that sort of slower process uh, to get that consent from elders and communities from the beginning of an idea of a project right through to the end of a project. Uh, so you can have a look on the Australia Council website for those protocols as well. Um, but I'll now go to the individual panellists and ask them each uh, their own uh, specific questions. So I'll go back to Lacey. Uh, in terms of Nike, what are they doing to help control, uh, control the narrative when it comes to preserving Indigenous cultures within North America? So I do want to, um, you know, go into more of like the facts of our Native community, our Indigenous community at Nike. So we are a very small portion of Nike. And so we are negative 0.1% um, of Nike's all employment in the US. So if you really want to get, you know, even deeper into that, so we are about approximately 123 um, indigenous employees and that's spread across corporate employees and also retail employees in the US. And only about approximately 45 are on, um, at corporate. So we have a very small community, yet we're very mighty, um, but we do have a smaller brand under Nike. So when you do think of you know, Jordan brand, which Jordan brand is huge, but it's a brand under Nike. So that's what Nike in seven is. And in seven, it stands for um, the seven generations wisdom, which means our actions today and our decisions affect the seven generations ahead of us. So. We, it was founded and created in 2009 by our founder, Sam McCracken, who is still at Nike today. And you know, back then it was super small and even too, we have a Native American network, um, which is one of the, the diversity programs that we do have at Nike. So you know, back then there was only five members of the, the leadership team, but now we're at 17. And so he created Nike N7 back in 2009, and there have been 25 unique collections um, in Nike N7, and it's all um, indigenous stories told. And you know, it represents all tribes, a lot of, not all tribes, but a lot of the tribes in the US. And um, so N7 celebrates the indigenous heritage within North America but it also empowers um, our youth to utilize sport as, um, as a positive change of action, a positive agent of change, actually. And so it's really geared towards getting our youth active and you know, outside because you know, diabetes and um, a lot of health problems are big on the reservation. So we utilize, you know, we use our voice to be able to get are people moving and you know of course Nike is a big sports company so we do um, have a lot of shoes that cater to all different sports and for footwear and apparel and accessories so it's really just a line that's dedicated to our indigenous people in North America so I mean it's it's a great thing and plus since we are such a huge advocate for getting our children moving, a lot of this money is going back into our communities. So from 2009, about 8 million has been awarded to 270 communities throughout the US reaching about 500,000 youth. And, you know, and this is just our small group of you know, six designers and a uh, a community of 45 people as far as indigenous at Nike. So I feel like this has just been always been a huge project and it's well known, especially more in our indigenous communities, but I feel like it's not nas nationally known, which, you know, which is what we are trying to do. But I feel like Nike, we are still, you know, trying to recruit more Native Americans and into our program and also, um, you know, retain the indigenous people that we still have today. But yes, so that is Nike N7. Great, thank you. I was just gonna ask in terms of, you, you said uh, in terms of publicizing that work, 
Is it on the Nike website or is it sort of? Yes. Yeah. So Nike N7 also is only available in North America. So we just cater to North America. It hasn't reached Australia, unfortunately. But yes, everything is on Nike.com. And then also in certain stores, it is available. So if you want to know if it's available, please call your store and or shop online. Great. Thank you. And now I'll turn to Amanda. Uh, so how do you, in terms of working with uh, the range of Indigenous artists that you work with, how do you choose which artists you're going to uh, collaborate with and how do you also ensure that fair and equitable returns go back to the, the artists in their communities? Yes. Um, I guess uh, the type of artists that I like to work with is, and it, it's just a simple commercial... Um, a system, I guess, that, you know, what I look for is prints that are repeatable and therefore printable. Because if you're, if you're printing, it's really hard and expensive to do placement prints. So if you've you know, got a, a picture of, let's say, a turtle, um, it's really hard to actually get that in the right place every time without it costing a lot of money. Um, so you, you try and find this balance between... Um, between uh, what's what looks good and what costs, you know, what's what's achievable cost-wise for the for a for a market that is sort of relatively new to indigenous products. So, um, so I guess I, I look for very specific prints, and you know, like they they often um, have a range of colours, and you'll see also the other one over there, which is um, called Proud. That's actually about celebrating our culture and being proud of who we are. The artist tells that story, just as you know, just as a result of living on Noongar country for many years and the 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 um, dislocation and exclusion that um, that are, that occurred for those people. So, you know, I look for those uh, sort of prints. Um, and as I said, you know, earlier, most of the artists come to me now these days and say, can I work with you? How do I make sure they're, they're treated fairly? We actually uh, defer to the protocols that um, Australian Council for the Arts have put together. But I also work very early on with Terry Janke, um, who is a well-known Australian lawyer in regards to um, Indigenous uh, intellectual property. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I, and I guess that we also are audited regularly, so I get an external auditor to come in and twice a year we check that we're actually, you know, everything we've sold is what we've accounted for and the artists take a percentage of every sale that I make. So there's a lot of record keeping and a lot of time and energy and it's not stuff that I love doing, <laughs> I have to say. So I've actually recently employed a virtual assistant who does, who's just picking up all of that work for me to make it a, and I'm sure she'll be a hell of a lot more efficient than I am at that sort of stuff. So, but um, overall, I'd have to say, you know, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to work with these artists who've got these amazing stories and amazing uh, cultural connection and connection to their country and their people and their, their stories. Thank you. Um, in terms of the number of artists you've worked with, do you sort of know how many artists you've worked with and where they come from? Is it mostly Western Australia or other regions? So I have worked with now uh, about 18 different artists, from, but from all across the country through the Northern Territory. I've got uh, people from uh, the back of New South Wales and Queensland. I've got Tasmanian, uh, a few from Noongar country, from the Pilbara, from the Kimberley. Um, I've got a lady coming on now from Yamaji country, which is the Murchison district of Western Australia. And I was listening before to all that mob talk about uh, um, the Torres Strait, which I'm sure is beautiful, but gee, so is Western Australia. Best beaches ever. <laughs> So, yeah, um, but look, you know, like I've worked with people from all over the all over the country, and you know, and I really select work based on what appeals to me, and it's sort of been reasonably successful because it seems to be appealing to others as well, and it's just such a great showcase because our artwork is so vibrant and so beautiful and so representative of our culture that I just love it. 
Great. Yeah, we do have beautiful beaches in the Torres Strait, but also in Western Australia. And, you know, in Australia, we have over 250 different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander language groups. So there's a huge range of artists that are working across communities uh, that uh, Kirikan and others can collaborate with. Uh, so, Brett, in terms of your um, VR, AR work, um, but also um, in terms of like preserving and protecting um, Indigenous cultures, do you, uh, do you need to get permission from elders to be able to use that content uh, in your VR, AR projects? Yes, we do, we do. But can I, before I say something, um, Nike used to sponsor me when, when I was a runner. And I did it six weeks in Phoenix, Arizona training as well uh, when I was younger. Oh, no, just saying. I just want to say that I got a connection. I just want to connect. That's very important. All right. And uh, um, I was running training with a guy called uh, Carl Lewis at the time. He was in Arizona at the time, so that was fun too. Hey, um, <laughs> does anyone know Carl Lewis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, um, Always where I go, we've got to work with First Nations people, so I always look for uh, getting guidance. So with, with being around for a long while, it takes years to get trust, all right? So you've got to keep going back there. My projects percolate for like seven years, usually, and longer, maybe longer. So it just, and then you, and then sometimes it works really well, and then sometimes the people that you connect with big time, the elders, sometimes aren't there after a while. And that makes it even harder to then go back and then rekindle those things. So, um, you know, we've got a big project with Larrakia Mob at the moment, project with um, uh, Gadigal people in Sydney, project with um, Wurundjeri people down in Melbourne, pe with Noongar people in Perth. Um, it, it's such a lot of work, you know, with all those different people and then having a champion in every one of those spaces is important. So I like to have a community lead in that, in those, um, engagements and then I just get told what to do and how to do it and we try to do it as well as we can. Um, it, when you get it right, it's rewarding and then um, talking with a, a lady, I don't know if you know her, called Aunty Caroline Hughes out of um, 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 Not All People out of Canberra. Um, her message is to me when you talk to them, when they message you back and they say sincerely with lots of emojis what you're doing, um, is the right thing. You just, it just makes you have a responsibility to do it right. And that's so important that you take the time to take the time. The protocols are important. I, made, I knew Terry when she first started that thing. Um, I was on the first committee, so, and we were trying to work out how to, how to do it. That, that committee came out of the, um, the um, Eva Valley Conference that talked about the Marbo Bill. And that's where those protocols came out of when we were talking about native title uh, and that what's going to be. But then we also knew that when that happened, that native title stuff, that basket of rights that came out of that had a big concern about cultural heritage, which was being neglected out of that. And then out of there came all these cultural heritage acts, or bills, I should say, and then that grew from there. That's where the protocol comes from. And when we do all the stuff we do in art, that expression about who we are, identity, that's how it all works. So you need to have that identity shared to you by the people who hold that so strong, that makes that identity so strong. And when we've got that right with our old people, the young people are better. But when that disconnect happens, then things go wrong. And, um, and you would know that, I'm sure of it. So we've just got to fight hard to strengthen that culture, connect our mob, young and old, from cradle to grave, and then we're going to be always better for that. So that comes from expression, be it dance, be it rock art, be it digital art, be it art on canvas, be it art on material. Look, I want you to talk about your, um, you know, how you're making materials. You know, the stuff about, you know, fabrics out of the, out of the, out of the land, out of Mother Earth. That's so special. So, you know, that stuff that you make me proud of it. So, anyway, there you go. And you too, sis. My, my son buys a pair of shoes, Nike shoes, every week. <laughs> and, and it's my money. <laughs> I don't know much. 
he can he can line them from that to that pole. So anyway, we should be shareholders. Speaking of youth, Brett, um, how does your youth engagement work uh, help to sort of build up expertise in this area around uh, digital technology and using and incorporating cultural knowledge uh, within those projects? Uh, we're going to 1,170 schools across Australia. How's that sound? Mm. Mm. I'm tired. Um, in Western, Western Victoria, I gate crashed a school of a town that's got 550 people in it. There was 67 kids and I was gonna to talk to one class. The school stopped teaching and they kept in. I, all I had was a couple of he VR headsets and, and I had kids who say, why did I bother coming to see, what did I go there for? Why are you here? They asked me. I said, because of you. I mean, that's why you do it. And if you connect with them, then they'll remember that we care. And if we care about them, in that school was seven Aboriginal kids. I didn't do it just for them, I did it for that. I did it with the Aboriginal kids to inspire them, but also to get allies. Because we need allies, don't we? Okay, and that's how it works. So. That youth engagement is just something we do. It's just, um, I used to be a teacher, and, I'm, and now, I'm, now I think from the kids I'm a student, so. Thank you. Um, so in terms of working in, this, in the creative industry space, in the fashion, uh, in technology, what are some of the most surprising lessons um, that you've learnt over the years in your practice? I think for me, I mean, there's been a million lessons, uh, but one of the most interesting things is, is the, the deep connection right across the world that we have. The stories that we tell are similar throughout the world. I always work with sustainable fabrics. So, you know, we're, we're talking about um, not just responsibility to my people, but responsibility to the planet, which is a very big part of our culture. So I use fabrics that um, come from, so I print onto cashmeres, like I make cashmere scarves, which are quite popular. And you can get them online, I'll tell you the address. <laughs> no, but, um, and they're made, they come out of the Kashmir Valley in um, Kashmir, because that's where you're going to get the best cashmeres in the world, is out of Kashmir. Um, but I work with a family over there that have been growing cashmere goats for, they say 700 generations, I'm not sure if that's quite true, but like, the, you know, like that's, that's a war-torn country and, and like, so we're just providing um, sustainable incomes to them as well, for them. So the depth of our connection across the world is, it's not just about Australia, it's about indigenous cultures throughout the world that, um, I've found the most deeply satisfying and deeply interesting to work with and, the, and how common the stories are that our people tell about our food, about our, um, about our um, creation stories, all of those sorts of things. The amount of commonality is far greater than uh, the differences that we, sh we have. So uh, we all bleed red. Um, and, and, you know, what I, the other thing that I totally love is working with the more traditional communities and, and understanding the depth of their culture, which is a truly beautiful thing in our own country, and how rich and deep that culture is and how, how we should be valuing it. And, I, and I'm really proud to be able to contribute to that in a small way by promoting culture through fashion. So what I feel like surprises me, but it's also not a surprise at all, but I feel like for me, I, you know, as we continuously start collaborating with different designers, artists, um, you know, our brand ambassadors such as athletes, I'm always blown away of how creative our people are. I mean, indigenous people in general, 
and also to connect with you. I also do a lot of youth outreach as well. So I, I do speak at a lot of schools um, within uh, the Navajo Reservation and you know just to really inspire them to to see that where they come from doesn't have to define any path going forward you know you can be from a small town but you can design you know for the number one sports company in the world you know you can get to that level or beyond you know you can be um, a professional athlete you know anything that you want to do and I feel like these kids they don't hear that enough and I think you know, I, I do meet a lot of um, youth in, you know, those areas, and they show me sketches that they have of shoes just from, like, doodling in class or just some projects that they work on on the side, but yet nobody, they haven't heard anyone coming from their community being able to make it that far. And I feel like we just, we're not highlighting, I feel like, our people enough in those creative areas because I feel like we can really change how, you know, collections or how things are designed because the richest stories that I do work on at Nike have always been, um, you know, indigenous inspired because this is really, this is true stories coming from, you know, our Native American communities and this is something that represents us. And so for me, it's like, it's always great to be able to work on something that's real. And, and I feel like we, we should always be highlighted in those areas. And I'm like, I'm pretty, I'm always proud of, um, you know, seeing our indigenous people being highlighted in these areas. So I'm just, I'm just really proud. And I'm proud of, you know, you all for, for doing that and showing your creativeness to the world because like, you know, it's amazing. Um, I'm just thinking there's a lot to say. Um, I think that what what is amazing to me is that everywhere that I spend the time, there's always people willing to share and I love that collaboration if we can achieve it. So, um, I'm really keen to start a project in the Kimberleys. Um, been talking to people over there and also with the Northern Land Council and some stuff over there. We're, we're trying to look at the work in Darwin and tell the stories of Larrakia mob. That'll just... And so in that regard, that it's so good just to give back to that. And when we do this work, um, we say we give it back to them so it's theirs. So we don't own it. We say here, we'll do it for you after we've done it. And I ask, can I share it? And it really confuses our mob sometimes that you do it the other way around. So we're trying to do a decentralised approach. And then we, and we have to educate people as to what decentralised means rather than, you know, doing it under the auspices of a, a Google or a Microsoft or a Amazon. So we're just looking at that stuff. So if we do that, I think we'll always win. And then once you get started and then you show them, show them how to fish, then they can do more in the digital space. So I love that. So the more that happens, the better it gets. And we just, we're on a journey. We're on a, like I said earlier, a digital walkabout. So the more we do it, the better it'll be. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. I just wanted to um, open up the floor to the audience if there are any questions, any burning questions that people have. Millie? consumer to those those collections I mean ultimately our indigenous communities are always going to be our prime consumer but that doesn't mean you know it's not available for everyone because I feel like for us this is always our opportunity to um, you know drive education um, visibility and representation so I feel like this is our our way of sharing, you know, with the world, this is who we are, this is, you know, something where you can support us. And so, but ultimately, our indigenous people will always be our main consumer. But I mean, it's available for everyone now. 
Hi, we're skewing down the front here. I'm interested, so Trish, in your opening, you talked about slowing down practice. And obviously, like, the world is discovering the power of First Nations creativity and there's a real appetite and thirst for it at the moment. So when you have a big opportunity and there's that sense of urgency around that opportunity, how do you balance that with slowing down and doing it the right way? Good question. Thanks, Georgie. <laughs> um, so in terms of... And I'll, I'll get everyone else also to talk to this point. But um, in terms of, uh, I guess, with the protocols and working with communities and on, on projects, uh, we really sort of encourage people that are wanting to uh, collaborate with Indigenous communities to first really sort of um, build in their timeline of their project that it might not, you know, happen straight away, that you do have to spend that extra time to first develop the relationship with your local Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community. Um, and, you know, that consultation can take a bit of time as well. You, you might get different families who will say yes and others who might say no. So you really have to factor in that extra time uh, in, within your process. Uh, and I think every kind of case study um, is really different. Some communities, you know, it might sort of take, uh, you know, like a really quick amount of time and others, um, especially if you haven't built those relationships up, you, you really need to invest in building up relationships first and then start talking about the idea of a project. And so that will sort of make the timeline um, a lot longer. But we always tell people, really factor in extra time um, within your project when you're working with Indigenous communities. But does anyone else want to... Yeah, I, I, I would say we live in a culture now that is about the right now. I want a response now, I need it now. And we're, you know, we always work in, com in the complete opposite to that as a as a culture, um, so it's sort of uh, it's sort of um, creating a, 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 like this need for the stuff. At, and you know, what's that old saying about scarcity creates necessity and stuff? So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we can keep the momentum happening over the next. And I'm I'm seeing it like every day. You're seeing new businesses starting with new ideas, with you know new fabrics, new approaches, new whatever, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're sort of getting to a bit of a, 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 a point where very soon there's going to be a really a, a reasonable amount of stuff available on the market. And all of that has taken such, you know, like as Trisha was just saying, it takes such a long time to get to that point. But it's worth investing that time for all of us, I think. I don't think anybody thinks any differently about it. Can I just make a point? Paddy Mills got car horns. Listen what we've got in the background. <laughs> so much better. <laughs> so, Paddy. Um, but, yeah, it, it is an interesting... It's, this, it's, it, it's a real interesting tension, isn't it, between wanting stuff now and taking time to do it properly. Well, I was going to say, um, as an example, we've got a project in Canberra with uh, a company called International Super Property Trust. And they're building a, a big building, renovating this big tall skyscraper. And uh, we've got a video wall we're gonna put in there. Um, we're gonna empty Lake Burley Griffin and go back to the original creek where the Nagalawal people camped all along it and gather bush foods, gather bush medicines. We're reconstructing it for that, that mob. Anyway, um, ISP wants it tomorrow <laughs> and, and I've slowed it all up and I made them go to a community meeting, a big language meeting. The big language meeting had a few aunties having a fight <laughs> and uh, it, it was just tension about cultural preservation and identity and stuff like that and ISPT didn't get it. They thought, oh, why aren't they all harmoniously getting on? And it doesn't work like that. We've got to get through that business. In, I don't know if you guys remember, think or know this. I think it, there's always an argument in the morning, but we settle it after lunch, don't we? And so after lunch, we get back into it and we get into the real nitty-gritty. Now, ISPT were there in the morning, <laughs> and then by the afternoon we had it settled, but they want to get this stuff done now, so we're in the middle of this, delivering this right this minute. We're trying to do it carefully, slowly. I want to get the, the sites right, and um, it's there's a deep longing for the for the cultural heritage that was sunk by that lake and we want to then show that and take it back and 
in effect, we're building, like I said earlier, a time machine and then allow people to see it. So we're, we've built a work that's going to be on the screen that runs for eight hours. Starts at the sunrise and finishes at the sunset and travels the entire length of the river encountering totem animals and sites and fishing sites and the work. So ISPT has to wait. That's generally the story. So, And they don't understand that it takes time to get it right, to get it authentic, to get it connected, to get it spiritually important, and then to, to allow the, I think I should say it like this, the generational trauma to play out. And that's... And when I say that story to you, we're doing that all over the country, and it's all over the country. It's a similar, similar feeling. Um, did you ever see Virtual Wajak? Yeah, I have. Yeah, do you like that one? Yeah, it's, oh, they're amazing. All of them. All oh of yeah, them, you know, are I, fantastic. I just I forgot I did something over there. I forgot the. I forgot yeah, that. you didn't I like drop in one. and see me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can you can throw a spirit. We were watching. The, the Wajak's another one, but we'll leave it there. That's enough. <laughs> I mean, I agree with what, you know, they're both saying. I mean, we do it right or we don't do it at all. Um, and I think especially going back to the Phoenix Suns collaboration, I mean, we were really very close to that deadline. Uh, but we did end up need to, like, extending it just because, especially with the 22 languages, that's what really... Um, kind of challenge us a lot because you're having to contact 22 tribes and also to like what we I mentioned before there was no written language in some of these languages so you know that's when we kind of had to slow it down and you know contact each and every one and make sure this is signed off because a language for sure is very the probably the most sacred thing that we can really put on a product so it needs to be correct, um, or pretty much we wouldn't do it at all. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I've probably got time for one last question. Um, okay, just checking, because I asked a question in the previous panel, so I don't want to take up too much. Um, but my question is specifically for you, Lacey. Um, so a couple of us here might um, be living in the US and working for a big corp um, or a, a tech company um, or any other kind of yeah, huge organization like Nike. I wanted to see if you had any advice for um, anyone working for one of those companies where potentially that company is not putting First Nations first. Um, what kind of advice do you have to anyone? So this would be in a way if we, if I didn't have like my network there, yeah. Okay, so I mean, I feel like it's where a lot of us, especially indigenous people that I have met in, in Portland, Portland, Oregon, is I feel like we tend to gravitate towards each other. I feel like we start building our own support systems within, you know, the small community. And I know there was like a Facebook group called like Navajos in the Pacific Northwest. And that's kind of where like everyone just added it on um, and they just talk about, you know, cultural foods that they're missing. Um, but I feel like we, it's important for us to just find each other because I think there's nobody that's gonna really connect with us unless it's people, especially people from our tribe because what we have gone through and what we go through is very different from, I feel like anyone else. And, you know, especially like our communities are very close knit and you know our families, and it's really even hard for indigenous students to even just gravitate from home. And I think that's what also hinders a lot of you know indigenous youth from getting an education and going away is because they don't have, they feel like they don't have that support system. But I feel like you're always going to find an indigenous community somewhere. Like you know even here, like I met you know a Navajo that I've known you know that she knew somebody that I knew from like Nike and you know and it was like a very random place so I feel like there's there's small in numbers but I feel like we'll always find each other and it, and it, it is important to be able to have that support um, because um, you know we really it's up to us to also support our communities and being able to represent our communities so um, you know we just kind of have 
have to find a way to thrive, but I feel like there's always somebody and, you know, we'll find each other one way or another. Great. So please join me in thanking our fabulous panel that has been looking at First Nations First protocols and indigenizing the creative industries. <laughs>